This is the podcast podcast for Multi-Faith Matters. I'm the host, John Moorhead, and I'm privileged today to have two guests with me in conversation, and I will introduce both of them. Uh, first of all is Dr. Michael Cooper, and I'll read a little bit of his bio here. These gentlemen have extensive bios from all the things they've been involved with over the years. Uh, Michael works with the Ministry of Physiology. He's the author of Contemporary Druidry, a Historical and Ethnographic Study, and he's the co-editor of Social Injustice and the Peaceable Christian, as well as Reflections on Post-Christendom Spiritualities. Michael has contributed to a number of academic publications, such as Nova Religio, Pomegranate, Journal of Nature, Sacred Tribes Journal, and so on. Uh, Dr. Cooper holds a PhD from Trinity International University, an MA from Columbia International University, and a BED from Texas A&M University. Then we have Dr. Andrew Perriman, and uh, he's with a great, uh, uh, his website is, am, am I correct if I call it post, p.ost, is that? I don't, I don't know how to say it, post, host. <laughs> I mean, well, it it's post a great, open uh, source, yeah. Yeah, it it's was a great post open open source to, to both of these the gentlemen. Point. I would encourage folks yeah. to, to seek that out, but that's how I found uh, Andrew. He's lived in various parts of the world over the last 30 years, the Far East, Africa, the Middle East, the Netherlands, and now he resides in London. He has combined theological studies and writing with pastoral and missional work in a wide range of contexts. He has a degree in English language and literature from Oxford and an MPhil and PhD from the London School of Theology. And Andrew has been involved in a number of publications as well. Um, Speaking of Women Interpreting Paul, Faith, Health, and Prosperity, a report on Word of Faith and a Positive Confession Theologies, The Coming of the Son of Man, New Testament, Eschatology for an Emerging Church, and Remission, a Vision of Hope for a Post-Eschatological Church, and the Future of the People of God, Reading Romans Before and After, as he turns the page, Western Christendom, and End of Story, some uh, Same-Sex Relationships and the Narratives of Evangelical Mission. Uh, he has also published a collection of blog posts on hell and heaven called Hell and Heaven in Narrative perspective and he's in are you still involved with communitas international andrew oh yeah very much yeah. okay an organization that seeks to develop open passionate creative communities of missional faith gentlemen welcome to the multi-faith matters podcast Thank well this you. is this is fun i hope it's fun i, I want to share for readers how we got to this moment um to have this conversation uh andrew comes at uh the topic of uh, engaging the world as a, a person of Christian faith from a narrative historical perspective. And uh, Michael is approaching it from a missional perspective. And I appreciate both of these frameworks and have benefited from the work that both of you are doing uh, over the years. And I just thought it would be interesting to have a conversation about what these two frameworks are about, uh, what they have in common, where there might be some disagreement. I think we're all united in agreeing that the church in the Western world is at a crossroads. Uh, We're not at a very good place, particularly in America for American evangelicalism. And I think having this conversation will help us. uh, This is not a debate. Um, This is a back and forth, a conversation that allows us to be uh, self-reflective, perhaps self-critical, help the church in that regard. And, And to begin as we navigate this, I think it would be helpful for both of you to take a few moments kind of just summarize uh, the lens, the framework that you bring to this conversation. Uh, Andrew, let's start with you. Folks probably uh, will not have a whole lot of awareness. What is the narrative historical approach? Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I should also say I, I know Michael from way back. I mean, we, we've had a lot of conversations, uh, not so much in the last few years, but uh, it's uh, it, Michael is a real uh, pleasure to reconnect in this way. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the narrative narrative and, and the history, uh, I, I had bolted the two terms together because it, it seemed uh, a certain amount of trial and error, but that seemed uh, and has remained for me the, uh, the, the most precise way of, of summing up uh, the approach that I've taken probably over the last sort of 15, 20 years in trying to make sense of uh, the New Testament in the first place, but also uh, how it speaks to us today, uh, not least how it uh, guides our thinking about mission in a, at a critical moment in the, the history of, of the church, as, as you've um, highlighted already. So, I mean, to take the two parts, and really it's very simple, um, 
I asked a question, uh, which is a question that is asked consistently now. Uh, well, I mean, it has been for a long time in New Testament studies. Uh, how does uh, how did Jesus and his followers, what who they were, what they were doing, what they said, how does that all make sense? Um, not from the perspective of the, the 20th, 21st century reader, uh, but from the perspective of those who uh, wrote the texts, first read the texts and so on uh, in, a, in a simple way. So how, how, do, how does the New Testament work as a historical document? So forgetting our, our modern interests in it, let's just ask the question, uh, which is to say New Testament studies, biblical studies has been asking for the two decades, two centuries now. Uh, how does it work historically? And, and as I think you've mentioned already, uh, the key part to that over the last few decades has been how does this work as a Jewish, uh, as testimony to Israel's uh, situation and perspective on the world and a whole bunch of questions uh, around that, because I think that's one of the key developments uh, in the way we think about the New Testament, that this is not uh, something that, that uh, existed, uh, that came to exist out of, dropped out of the blue, exists in a vacuum. It's part of history, and critically, it's part of Israel's history. So that's, that's the first question. The second part to it is, well, uh, um, a, a narrative, is, it's, it's not just history. A narrative is a story that we tell uh, for a purpose. Uh, I mean, his, history, broadly speaking, we, we construct as a story. But I, I think part of what I want to get at there is that in, in its proclamatory aspect, uh, in, it, in its theology, in, it, in, it, in the way that, that Jesus and, and the apostles reflected on uh, the historical situation of, that they were in, they did so by telling a story. Uh, and this is, this is sort of core to biblical testimony. It's, it goes right back to the beginning. Israel has always told its story at every, every stage. Uh, you, you look back at what has brought you to a situation, you look at the situation that you're in, and increasingly Israel comes to look, well, no, all the way through, Israel is looking forward to what comes next, how uh, a situation, a crisis will be resolved at some point in the future. Where is this story taking us? And I, as, a, as a hermeneutic, as a way uh, of broadly framing the way that we think about scripture, I, th that's what I want to do. I want to keep both those aspects together. Uh, the, the, as, as far as one can, and there are limitations to this, as far as one can, I, I think it is important that we uh, read historically uh, and with the, the various limitations and constraints uh, that that imposes upon us. But we, by, by thinking of this as a narrative, it, it becomes a story that we tell because we are part of that story. Um, and it's that become that for me is a very, in very broad terms, I mean, clearly not everything in scripture looks like narrative but in, in broad terms a story is being told that, that that goes all the way back to Abraham and looks ahead to a future and and that story I think uh, very much frames the way that Jesus and his followers uh, acted and what they proclaimed to uh, in, in various contexts uh their their view of things but it also and this is i think you know for me this is where we get to the missional part we keep we have to keep telling that story we have told that story all the way through uh from jesus through the uh work of the apostles the mission of the apostles through uh millennia two thousand years of church history to the present day uh and i think it's very helpful uh to think of our own historical context and how we continue to tell that story now uh, as a story about history. And, and I guess, I mean, you know, might be one of the key sort of theological parts to this is I would emphasize uh, that we bear witness to the God of history. Uh, mm. It's uh, the God who is present with his people, uh, judges his people, redeems his people, 
redirects his people, reforms his people continually through changing historical circumstances. And that applies all the way up to where we are today with our own uh, uh, backstory, uh, which as you said, is uh, a very difficult one for us and puts us in a very difficult position today. Uh, and, and with a future that is becoming increasingly frightening. For, for many, challenging uh, as we, we look towards the, the impact uh, globally of climate change. So that, that's the narrative and the history, how I, you know, simple, as best I can, how they work together to make sure that scripture as history is also, and I'll use the word evangelical because, you know, from my, where I sit, evangelicalism is not such a bad thing these days. I, I do think there is an evangelical part of this with a very small e, uh, but I, th I think it's critical. It, re it remains something that we live out, something that inspires, something that motivates, uh, and something that gives shape and direction and purpose to mission. Uh, quick follow-up on that, Andrew, before Michael discusses the, the lens and the framework that he uses. Is one of your concerns from this narrative historical perspective that we often bring theology in, theology prevents us, our theological assumptions and frameworks prevents us from reassessing and getting back at the narrative and the history. And, and it, really, we need to look at the narrative and the history and then come away with our theological conclusions. They're obviously intertwined, but it seems that theology yeah. is the controlling framework. Is that a concern? Yeah, I, I mean, it's certainly, it's, it's partly theology. I mean, we have a history of you know, we have rationalized our theology, uh, you know, starting with the, the church fathers, because it, that needed to be done. So you, you, you devise a system of thought that uh, you think best uh, encapsulates the, the core truths of scripture. And then you transmit that down the ages, down from generation to generation, and it gets, it gets modified, it gets pulled in different directions. And, and, and it, you know, our theology to today is not just a summary of, of the New Testament, it's also a, a reaction to uh, the particular circumstances that we are in. It's, it, we, we are adjusting it all the way. Uh, that's part of it. Practicality is part of it. Well, and certainly when you start talking about mission, and this is my experience with working with a mission organization, uh, trying to do theology in the context is mission, of mission, is that actually what, what, what motivates people is that the practice of evangelism or the practice of church planting or the, the practice of, of missional incarnation or something or other and, and that also very uh, very much limits how we think biblically so I the, the the positive ambition in this is to recover the New Testament in particular for for what it was historically in the conviction that that is the best way of, of grasping what what, uh, what this is all about, what the whole church thing, Christian thing, mission thing is all about. Does, that, does, it, does that answer that question? Yes, I, yes, I think yeah, so. Yeah. Theology think... and practice both tend to narrow the lens too much because they have their particular purposes, their particular interests. Uh, tradition, obviously, is a, is a hugely powerful force behind theology and, and you know, sustaining theology and, and it's to a degree uh, making it very difficult for us to go back to scripture and read it historically. Okay, thank you. Andrew. So we have the narrative historical component. Michael, the daunting task of uh, summarizing a, a missional approach that you drew mm -hmm. upon. Yeah, well, you know what? I'm just sitting here listening to Andrew having all these flooding of memories of us sitting around dinner tables or pubs or wherever talking about these things. And a lot of what Andrew has shared is um, at, at some level an approach that I take as well. I value, highly value the historical narrative approach as we look at scripture. I, I think what I add to that to, I hope, uh, uh, complemented is a missiological approach, and I, I will differentiate that from missional. I, I don't, to be honest, know really how to define missional. It's been used in so many different ways by so many different people um, that there's not a, there's not a real clear, uh, I should say, I, I suppose it's fuzzy in my mind, 
missiological, though, I think is a, a proper uh, theological academic discipline when added to a historical narrative approach uh, of looking at scripture that is very deliberate in understanding the not just not just narrowly narrowly the historical part but the ethnic component to uh, what's going on in uh, the time of the new testament the cultural as well as the religious it's very interested in uh, th those studies of that first century um, and how that impacts then our reading of those scriptures. But it's also interested, of course, in the theological part as well. How is it that the writers of the New Testament are describing God or describing Christ or the Holy Spirit? And um, how much of that then has been informed at some level uh, by their understanding of their cultural particularities that they're addressing or the ethnic or religious uh, particularities. And, uh, and so it's very interested in that intersection of the ethnic, cultural, religious with the theological in a, a particular context that is narrative. Um, and, uh, and so it's looking for the stories that are being told by those um, New Testament writers that are connecting with their particular audiences, um, and, uh, and especially the stories about Jesus and how those stories are connecting with audiences. I think to illustrate this, uh, um, I often refer to the Gospel of John that was, uh, that most scholars will agree was written in the city of Ephesus. Uh, the, the story of, of at least that Jerome relates to how John was persuaded to write that gospel. Of course, it's tradition that's passed down. We don't know for sure if that's what influenced him or not, but he was not at all desirous of writing the stories about Jesus, but uh, was persuaded by the bishops uh, in Ephesus and Asia, Roman Asia, to uh, write one, and John said that he would do it if they would fast and pray, and so they committed to fasting and praying, and as Jerome relates, that when they broke their fast was when John wrote down, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and so that beautiful prologue uh, of that gospel was a very deliberate uh, connection on the part of John to the philosophy of Heraclitus, uh, the 6th century BC uh, pre-Socratic uh, uh, philosopher who writes the text on nature that expresses the, the idea of the logos. And in essence, what John is saying is that what you all in Ephesus have believed implicitly, I am going to declare to you now explicitly that this logos that you're familiar with is in fact Jesus. And so it's, it's missiological theology, as I would define it, is that task of connecting those stories about Jesus with particular cultural uh, issues uh, um, or uh, peculiarities, if you will, that will help make sense of who Jesus is uh, to a group of people. And so it, it has to incorporate the narrative, the historical, um, but also the, the missiological, the, the deeper study of what's going on ethnically uh, in the writing, uh, in the time of the writing, but um, also culturally and religiously. A quick follow-up for you, Michael, uh, like I had for Andrew. I, I was intrigued in our email exchanges setting up this conversation. Um, you mentioned that you prefer not to use the term incarnational in connection with mission. And we, I see that frequently, uh, incarnational mission. In fact, uh, recently I floated out the idea in social media that perhaps we could ground a Christian engagement with other religions in some of the work of uh, Michael Gorman with his idea of cruciform spirituality based upon uh, what seems to be a central concern of the Apostle Paul. And I received uh, <laughs> some strong pushback from a noted missional uh, personality saying, no, 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 why, why, it needs to be in things like incarnational mission. Why, why do you not attach the word incarnational to your missional work? 
You know, I'm one of those, I don't know if I would identify myself as a theological purist or, or something, but those deep uh, theological words, I think, have deep meaning because they're theological words. And when we uh, use them in relationship to other things, I think uh, the meaning can be diffused at some level. And so when I think of the incarnation of Christ uh, coming in the flesh, taking on the form of humanity and uh, so that he relates to us on a human level is something that was is uniquely Christological. Um, and I, I don't see in terms of missionaries uh, or even mission organizations, I don't see that they can be incarnated in that same way to take on a cultural form, because there's always, I mean, uh, Andrew might disagree with me here, but uh, I, I don't know, I can't remember if we've had this conversation, maybe we have in the past, but, um, you know, we lived for a, a decade in uh, another country, and I spoke the language fluently, I knew some of the cultural, uh, the, you know, uh, the particularities of the country, uh, but as hard as I could try, I could never be Romanian just because I'm not. I mean, there are things, history, uh, there are phenotypic features, there are, you know, experiences that Romanians share that I don't. And, and so in that sense, I cannot ever be incarnated in that place uh, as a Romanian to take on the, the complete Romanian form. Jesus, though, uh, when he came to earth, he took on all of human experience. Uh, his, his humanity was complete. Um, and so it was a real incarnation. Now, that being said, I, I am uh, much more open to the idea of the body of Christ being incarnated into a culture. Uh, to, because it is the body of Christ with him as the head, I think uh, the body of Christ can incarnate in a culture, take on the forms of culture uh, so that it is rooted in that culture. And so I think it's proper that we can speak of an incarnational church, if you will, if we're understanding church as the body of Christ. Well, thank you both for trying to summarize and articulate the perspectives that you're coming from as the basis for the, the conversation. Uh, having heard each other share that, that's not news to you. You both have known where you're coming from. What, what areas of agreement do you have, not only in terms of your different positions, but the concerns that you might have for how the, the church moves forward in the West in a very challenging environment? What are your thoughts, Andrew? Well, I mean, I what's going on in my head at the moment are a couple of things. One is um, how the narrative works. Uh, I mean, and this is, that's, I think, probably an area of disagreement. I, at least in, in practice, it would be an area of disagreement, because, partly because our, uh, our sort of general focus is, in, is on different things. I, it, I'm just reflecting on this incarnational mission thing, though, because, I mean, one of I, I mean, my, my, uh, uh, Michael, you, you put it in sort of classic terms, this sort of incarnation thing, sort of Jesus and God becomes flesh. That, that, I, don't, I don't think the, the New Testament puts it quite so sharply, so, so clearly. I think that that's part of it, that I, I'd sort of locate that a bit down the road, that such a, a clear statement of the incarnation. But what I do think is you, 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 the New Testament uses this idea of the, the wisdom of God becomes flesh or the, the, the word becomes flesh or the, the word is manifest and no, sorry the wisdom of God is is manifested or incarnated in in what is going on in Jesus and and the interesting thing ab about that from from you know my point of view is it's it, it's uh, it, it's God engaging with with a situation according to his own wisdom now it, it, put aside the, the incarnational implications of it for a moment. The, I think what Paul is doing, in, for example, in, in the first chapters of, of 1 Corinthians, is, is dealing with the problem 
that this really doesn't look, you know, this whole crucifixion thing just doesn't look right to the Jew, it doesn't look right to the Greek. But his, his argument is this expresses this, ex, this uh, peculiar wisdom of God, that, that, that this is how God saw fit. This is how uh, God, this is God's solution. And it, and it, and it, it just doesn't make sense. It's, it doesn't look like a wise solution, but the wisdom of God is very different. If you, you I, I mean, I think, you know, the, you've probably got something like that even in, in the, um, the prologue to John's gospel, where the word becomes flesh. And, and by the time he says that, we're well into the story of Jesus. And the baptism and so on there's something going on here not just in the person of Jesus but in this whole sequence of events that, that expresses and articulates the uh, very improbable wisdom of God that, that everything should you know that, that turns everything on its head and and brings about God's purposes uh, not through strength not through uh, rationality not through reason but through folly through weakness, through suffering, and ultimately through death. Not only the death of Jesus, but this is very becomes very much part of Paul's testimony. It comes about. It's it's this whole thing is enacted through the suffering uh, and and the death of of the apostles eventually. Uh, but I, I think why not say that again today? About because the whole missional incarnational thing is a, a novel development. It's not how the church in the West, at least, has had to function uh, over the last 15, 1800 years. There's a new, you know, the wisdom of God is doing something different again. And, and in, I think in, in quite a sort of New Testament way, uh, and this is a little bit off the top of my head, it was only sort of listening to you, that I thought, that, this, this is intriguing, that, you know, maybe we can say that the, the peculiar wisdom of God is, is happening in uh, odd, unexpected, unconventional, untraditional ways and it, uh, expressing itself through uh, uh, this, this approach to mission, uh, mm. which in many ways is sort of counterintuitive uh, and everything else, just as it expressed itself or yeah, it expressed itself ex uh, supremely and, and centrally in the, the life and death of Jesus and in the, the mission of the early church, which was not, you know, the, the Jews wouldn't have gone about it this way, the Greeks wouldn't have gone about it this way, but God does. Mm. So that, that was, that was I, I, I thought, you know, this is a, a very interesting question. Maybe, maybe there is, uh, it's sort of stepping back from that classic theological def definition of incarnation, I think sort of stepping back historically from it back towards uh, what was a, an earlier, more dynamic, uh, realization that, that the wisdom of God was actually being worked out and expressed in some really quite uh, unconventional ways. Yeah, yeah, I love that, Andrew. And I think that's the, I mean, in one sense, that's the essence of the Missio Dei, the, the God who is sending himself uh, to engage. He, he wants to be known and uh, and in spite of our inabilities to always do that effectively, um, he continues to want to be known, and he is making himself known in different cultures and different through different uh, unique uh, events, perhaps uh, by his own wisdom that might seem foolish to us, as you said. Um, but that's still his desire. You know, I know. Um, you know, the one example I think of, at least in the Book of Acts, is of course Paul at the Areopagus, and uh, he says, you know, in verses 26, 27, 28, around there, uh, chapter seventeen, he says uh, something to the effect that you know it's God who has determined the boundaries of people; mm. He's placed them there as if, you know, God is actively engaging in different cultures. And, and why is that? And Paul answers and says, because he's hoping that in some way people will grasp for, for him and, and, uh, and know him. And then, of course, he quotes from two philosophers, one of whom we know as Aratus. And he says, in him, we live and move and have our being, uh, referring, of course, Paul to, uh, to God, that in God, we live and move and have our being. But of course, the phenomenon that Aratus writes is in reference to Zeus. Uh, 
but a, a kind and benevolent Zeus. But, but what I love about that passage is it's almost as if Paul was saying, well, look, your own philosophers are revealing who God is. This God who has determined your boundaries, who is hoping that you'll reach out to him and grapple for him, he is revealing himself through your own philosophers. And now what you have known dimly, uh, I am revealing in, in all of light that this is the God that you're, you're searching for. And that does seem foolish to us. I mean, uh, it, it does seem foolish that we would think that God would work uh, outside of the mechanism that, you know, we might think is the proper way for God to work. Um, but, you know, that's part of his wisdom and I suppose our, our foolishness. Can I, can I sort of respond to that? Yeah, go ahead. John? because sure. um, I think this gets to my other issue and I think you know where there is a, there, there might be sort of more fundamental disagreement I, I, I like like you I think that passage in the, in the story about what happens in Athens is uh, far more important than, than we've sort of usually given it credit for um, you, you make the point that uh, you know Paul's part of what Paul says is that they, they, they've they worship, they've got all these idols, but, but right at the heart of it, there, there's still that, there was that possibility of, of discovering the true God, which is very similar to, you know, the argument in Romans uh, chapter one, at least mm. at some point, the Greeks ought to have been able to uh, acknowledge the creator God because, because of the created order. You look at that and you, you recognize maybe the Zeus, uh, the, you know, the, that great God idea but they didn't they chose to worship idols and Athens what, what Paul has seen walking through the streets of Athens is is the idolatry part of it but he he doesn't the wisdom there if you like and I'm not sure wisdom is quite the right term that's not he doesn't leave it there that, that actually the, this this uh, perception of God is sort of latent all along and they they could have picked up on it and he, he's not his point is not to uh, help them uh unpack this sort of innate appreciation of God what he says is God has lost patience with this whole mm. arrangement uh, and he's no longer willing to overlook these centuries of uh, Greek uh, rejection of the creator God therefore he has fixed a day when he will judge the uh, not the cosmos, but the oikumene, you know, which I think in Luke is pretty much definitely the empire, or at least the Greek and Roman world that is uh, at, at the heart of which is either Rome or Athens. You know, it's it's either the political cap uh, center or the uh, religious and um, philosophical center. He's going to judge it, and he's, and, and, and 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 to sort of make the point he has raised judging by a man whom he has appointed and he's given evidence of this of evidence of this by raising him from the dead part of my approach would be to highlight those expectations of really quite dramatic divine intervention as as, as critical for understanding the new testament story so I mean, i'm sure we've had this conversation i think you know effectively there are three eschatological horizons in the New Testament. The first one is um, the judgment of, on Israel in the form of the uh, destruction of Jerusalem, the temple. The second one is judgment on that pagan world that which uh, had for so long had opposed and uh, the Lord and his anointed. Um, and then a final uh, final judgment when uh, that, that brings in the whole of creation interview which you you see at the end of, of revelation now it seems it seems to me that you know if you're going to go back and, and and sort of stand where jesus stood or stand where peter stood uh, early in acts or stand where paul stood on the areopagus you have to ask well, what do they how far do they look in into the future and i, I think so one of the, picking up on some of the things you've said um and, and I had a look at the Ephesio, I looked at the Ephesiology book as well, I, you know, which is, I, I'm going to use that as a, as a missional resource. But I, in, ter in terms of my hermeneutic, I, I want to, to bring history back into focus, because I think it explains so much uh, in the New Testament. The problem then is that the, we, well, then it's all history. 
what can we do mm. with it today? And that then becomes this challenge of, that, uh, that uh, I highlighted at the start of, well, we have to keep telling the story through. So actually, from where we stand today, part of our story is not just the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's not just uh, the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. It's not even just the conversion of, of the Greek and Roman world, which I think is what Paul is predicting in Acts 17. It's the whole history of Christendom with all its um, strengths and weaknesses. Uh, it, it's, it, you know, the, uh, which has left us where we are now struggling to deal with uh, secularism and, and everything else globally. And you know, that's, that's, that's my, would be my approach to mission is, okay, we make it much more complicated uh, perhaps, but it, 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 it gives us a basis for engaging with God in history, just as Jesus had to do because of the crisis of Israel's rebellion against God, just mm. as Paul had to do, because it had suddenly become clear, I think, that the God of Israel, a marginal state on the edge of the empire under, under Roman occupation, that, that beleaguered God was about to take control of the whole of, of the Greek and Roman world, which is quite, you know, if uh, in historical terms, it's an absolutely extraordinary thing to claim. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think that gives us then a basis for dealing with history much more seriously. And I, I do think mission today has to take hi history or, you know, the concrete experience of the church, wherever we are in the West, in, in the United States um, globally, has to take that, that into account. Um, and then, we, I mean, we could then get on to a discussion of what the gospel is um against that backdrop because i think it, it casts the gospel or the kingdom in, in a rather different light but i mean the, mm -hmm. that's sort of taking it a, a, a bit further so i yeah. that would be my pushback to uh to you um from you know this sort of narrative historical point of view that this the narrative part and the historical part it's not just a matter of taking you, you talked about ethnic cultural religious contexts it's also taken into account the uh, eschatological context or the prophetic context, how, how God's people are interpreting history, uh, the apocalyptic uh, dimension of, you know, the Jewish apocalyptic dimension of the New Testament, which is, I, I think, much more sharply focused on pressing urgent historical circumstances than, than it is in our uh, from from our point of view, oh, did you yeah. hear that? That was Siri interrupting. I don't know what I did, but um. yeah, you know, Andrew, I don't, I don't, I mean, I wouldn't disagree with you. I, I think, uh, and this might be one of the gaps that that as I'm thinking through the missiological theology part, uh, where does the, the the eschaton fit there? And we have been working on that. Uh, we did a series and uh, developed a course on how do you read Revelation um, mm. today? And I wrote a, um, a, a just a little book on, actually, it's, it's funny because it's a commentary on the first commentary on the book of Revelation. And what was it that in the third century people were thinking about when they were thinking about uh, the end times? And uh, and so yeah, I, I mean I recognize that 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 theme certainly is present uh, in the minds of the apostles as as they're thinking about you know what is the trajectory of of all of this. I think though with between you and me, and this is a discussion that we have had. Um, I, I mean, there's not a huge gap. I think we, we approach history maybe a little bit differently, um, just in in terms of New Testament history. Where, where you'll place, and I think rightly, and, and maybe this is a, another gap uh, that I don't place a lot of, of uh, emphasis on the Jewish nature of the New mm -hmm. Testament, just because I, I see the missiological in there. Um, you know, you think of the, the Gospels, uh, Mark writing from Peter's perspective, and poor Greek grammar is trying to, to uh, relate uh, Jesus to uh, the, the church in Rome, uh, believers in Rome. Luke, of course, to a Gentile. Matthew, who originally writes in Aramaic, is is the most Hebrew of them all. And then John, 
just makes this, I think, at least as I read the Gospel of John, just makes this astounding shift from Jesus the Messiah to Jesus the Savior of the world. And uh, that, that language shift that we see in John, and, the, and then the, the stories that he chooses to relate about Jesus that really connect to the cultural uh, context of, of Ephesus, um, kind of make me think that, you know, there's much more of a missiological nature to uh, the Gospels than perhaps we might uh, attribute to them. Um, well, the, then, you mean to John's to John's Gospel? It, well, it, well, to all all four, I suppose. I mean, they they are written. Uh, those are the evangelistic tracts, if you will, um, of the first century that are written to particular uh, people. Um, and, and they express Jesus in particular ways. Um, John's, I think, that, of course, uh, the uniqueness of his gospel is that he tells different stories, but um, there's such different stories and, and, uh, and parallel to the culture of Ephesus, uh, you really begin to see that John's concern is that he tells the true stories about how Jesus lived his life as, as a person in Palestine uh, from a historical narrative uh, the manner, but the stories are connecting directly to circumstances in Ephesus. Yeah. I mentioned John 1 and the, the Logos in Heraclitus, but all throughout, um, you know, John 2 and the wedding at Cana, uh, Artemis is the goddess of matrimony, um, John 4 and the Samaritan woman uh, the parallels with the situation with the courtesans in Ephesus and those women who were entertaining men, much like the Samaritan woman seemed to have been entertaining uh, men. Um, he, he's making these real stories about Jesus um, and, and telling them in such a way that when a person in Ephesus would read it or hear it, yeah. most likely, they would say, oh, I, I get that. That makes I understand what what is happening here. Uh, that Jesus loves that woman uh, the, in Samaria just like he would love a woman that is frolicking around with with men in in Ephesus. Um, and and then you know all throughout that. And so, um, did John shy away from Jesus's Jewishness? No, absolutely not. But he related his Jewishness in a way that would connect with the Gentile issues. That yeah. I, I mean, I think that I, I think that's really interesting. And it's not not a way of, of reading John that I, I, I sort of come across before. So that's um, that's worth looking at. The other side to that coin, sort of, I mean, th these are the positive ways in which John has, has, is telling the story. And I agree he's telling the sto Jesus story. He's telling the, the gospel story about the historical Jesus, uh, he, but he's telling it for a different readership, for a different audience. But he also, um, it's what he omits as much as anything that I, I find interesting because what you don't have is that apocalyptic outlook. You don't have that interest in well, well, what lies ahead. What is gonna to happen to this generation? What is going to happen within a generation, uh, within the lifetime of some of those standing here? The, the, that sort of language that you hear in the Synoptic Gospels. Uh, and, and above all, you, do, you don't have that apocalyptic discourse uh, climaxing, in my uh, understanding, in the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple as an act of uh, mm -hmm. the wrath of God, an expression of the wrath of God. Um, and the associated vindication of the, the, the Son of Man, which, again, you know, we can disagree about the, the, the precise reading there. But John, John doesn't have that. So, I mean, already you've lost a real interest in, you're, you're beginning to lose a real interest in history. Uh, and, and so John is not, uh, does not have much to say about what is going to happen to Israel, what is going to happen to Jerusalem. But it's, the, and, and the, the telling thing is, um, you know, whereas the um, synoptic gospels, the uh, incident, the event in the temple, Jesus throwing out the money changers, that whole thing happens right at the end. 
John moves it to the beginning as though, okay, that's where I'm starting from. That's not the end of my story. That's the beginning of my story. The fact is that, that this, uh, this prophetic action in the temple, which effectively is Jesus' way of saying to uh, the temple authorities what Jeremiah had said to the temple authorities way back, uh, John takes that as his starting point. Okay, so that's where we, we begin. Now we need to work out, well, how do we tell this story in uh, that, that was about Israel and the temple and Jerusalem? How do we tell that story in Ephesus? Uh, mm -hmm. that, that, make, that to me makes a lot of sense. And, and then in the early church, I, it, it, I, I'm not a, an expert on the, on the early church of the fathers by, by any stretch of the imagination, but it does seem to me that, that John plays a, a disproportionately large role in the construction of, of sort of the essential theology of, um, of the early church. And indeed, is the, sort of the go-to gospel for so much of our theology and thinking and mission evangelism today. Uh, because uh, you know, and that's uh, that's how that historical dimension gets excluded because everything John has just sort of swollen to yes. to fill the screen. Yeah, no, I, I I agree with you, Andrew, and I think to your point that um, we need as a church and particularly as the evangelical church because we have a historical amnesia. Uh, we don't really know where we come from. We only trace our history back 500 years when really we need to be tracing it back uh, 2,000 years. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. somehow we have to recover that uh, if we're going to move forward to whatever it is that is going to be in the future of the evangelical church. Uh, getting to your question, John, that you had posed a, a moment ago. Um, Andrew, I appreciated it so much of what you said at the very beginning that you do see that there is some value to uh, the evangelicalism. And, uh, and I would agree with you. I, I think it's, it's interesting to me in the American context, um, evangelicalism is, is uh, what we would say is the whipping boy these days. Uh, we like to attack it and deconstruct it and, and uh, blame it for all sorts of evils. But uh, the, the American evangelical church is just a small minority of the total of evangelicalism, globally speaking. And uh, it seems rather arrogant to me to think that we, in the context of the United States, um, find it proper for us to redefine evangelicalism as if the world shouldn't be speaking in that, into that as well. I think what's needed, John, um, in the context of, of the United States and uh, the American Evangelical Church, is we need to listen to brothers and sisters around the world about what evangelicalism properly is, because in many ways, they've preserved what we've lost. Um, although, you know, they're, uh, it's not to paint a pristine picture of evangelicalism around the world. There are issues, certainly, but but we we need to be a little bit more open to listening to what uh, others say is evangelicalism and not be so fast to poo poo it and think that that uh, we're going to do something better or different or or whatever. Well, let me get uh, your feedback on something that uh, Andrea said uh, probably about halfway through our conversation that I want to pick up and get your response from both of you. I want to make sure I understood Andrew correctly. You were mentioning uh, in the New Testament, there's this emphasis on humility and, and suffering and the wisdom of God through that. And Paul articulating why it seems to be foolishness, but this is divine wisdom. And did I hear you say that you don't know if that's something that we can present and build upon today. It, it, looking, I don't know what this context is in the UK, but in America, it seems to me that that is precisely the prescription that we need to grab onto again for American evangelicalism. We're so used to being uh, having numerical superiority, being allied with political power, that yeah. we've lost the sense of our rootedness in uh, servanthood, humility, suffering, and so at least in the American church context, I think that that is something that we need to contextualize and frame and articulate and live out again. Did, did I misunderstand what you were saying, Andrew? No, I, th I think that's right. Um, that, was, I guess that, that was a little bit off the top of my head talking about uh, 
uh, how you know the incarnational wisdom idea uh, i mean I, I certainly i think that that, that would be my view i, I mean I, I i push back a little on this sort of cruciform uh, theology thing a little bit because um uh, I, I think there's always sort of two sides i mean you, you pointed out that i'd written a book on on faith theology earlier and and part of i i, I went you know when I bent over backwards to sort of uh present uh prosperity theology faith theology in a positive way i mean there's only so far you only so far backwards you can go before you fall over uh, but there is they do have there is a point to that it's uh there's there's a suffering part and there's there's a, a prosperity part uh and I, there's a journey through the wilderness and there's israel in the land there's the suffering of jesus and the apostles and then you know as i sort of tell this story through uh, uh there's there's christendom and and christendom is a little bit like uh you know the israel in the land writ large it's just now we're, we're on an empire scale rather than a nation scale um i i still think god is in that for all it's just that history is always messy and humanity is always sinful and the church his people always let him down um but I, you know in, in as from a narrative historical point of view yeah so I, I i i wouldn't make i don't i wouldn't want to make the cruciform thing the the sole lens for viewing what the church is because i i don't think you can you can shoehorn the whole of the history of God's people into that I think there's a lot of other things that, that need to be taken into account plus uh, you know Jesus is is the crucified one but he's also the resurrected Lord um, who is given all authority and power and you we can't uh, you, you know we they, this is our we, we're not we're, we're barely in the situation that the apostles are in where, who are actively living out the suffering of Jesus under pretty much the same circumstances certainly initially and then you take that into the wider world um we're, we're not doing that we're not living out the crucifixion we're not we can't boast in the way that paul boasted about being crucified with christ i mean we put up with a certain amount of inconvenience and uh, you know goodness knows what from time to time uh but i you know part of this is actually looking at the situation saying well what is really going on here does it actually conform to to what is being spoken about in in the new testament context i think there's a, we can overstate that nevertheless i do think there is something going on in the church that is turning things on its head I, and and okay the, the situation in in europe is one of the difference one of the reasons why we we can we don't have quite the problems that you have with evangelicalism is that we are a much weaker uh institution uh and we do not have anything like the same authority that um, uh, the, the church, broadly speaking, does still in, in, in America. So we, we've had to sort of get used to being marginalized and we, or we've had longer to get used to it. So uh, it, missional incarnation, I mean, for many people that that means, I mean, as it does in places in the US, it means working with marginalized people. So you, you the, the, the church, uh, you know, one of the reasons, one of the, the prophetic reasons, I think, why the church locates itself amongst homeless people in many in many contexts now, and we we do this in our church in in London. I was at the the drop in yesterday. You're hanging out with homeless people. Well, it's because the the, the church is homeless. The church is marginalised. The church is looked down upon in much the same way that society looks down on homeless people. So there's an identification there with exactly what Paul talks about in, in 1 Corinthians. Uh, we, no, no, not many of you were uh, powerful, not many of you were wealthy. No, see, see the, the, it, we, the church, the community embodies what God is doing. I, I mean, maybe you could put this in, in Missio Dei terms. I, I don't know, we haven't really talked about that. Um, but I do think that the, the, the concrete expression of the church as it moves forward in mission ought to, embody at the moment that a wisdom of god that is that is rescuing a situation um and but it's also i the other part of this is well how, how is the church going to uh function how is the church going to witness as uh if the, the you know the worst forecasts of climate change prove true and correct and, and, and there's a whole uh you know we, we could see society being 
thrown into disorder in all sorts of ways. Um, how is God preparing the church for that outcome? And this is part of you know narrative. What's the story going on here? Uh, and okay, so one more sorry, um, one more point that I, I like to make in in that context is Paul. Again, we're, we're in one Corinthians three. Paul talks about the work of the apostles, which is to build communities on on the foundation of Christ, because only. Uh, you know, the Christ is the one who died and was raised to build them out of um, valuable materials, the materials that won't be burnt up in a fire. Uh, and I, again, uh, a, a sort of broad general evangelical eschatology says, well, that's because at the final judgment, it will be determined whether the work of the apostle was 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 good or not. I, I think in, from Paul's point of view, that day of fire is a day of persecution. So you build churches on, on a foundation of Christ because only a church willing to suffer as Christ suffered will survive persecution. Only a church, this, as a, only a community formed out of a certain type of material will survive persecution. And, and all through Paul's letters, you see him trying to, doing his, doing his best to shape communities that will survive persecution, including uh, Ephesians, which, which, you know, that that... Uh, put on the whole armor of the Lord. These need to be churches that know how to put on the whole armor of God because they will face an evil day, uh, literally, uh, in history. And I, I think we need to be doing the same thing now. And that's why I think uh, a narrative that gives us a sense of why we are where we are and where we are going, which is a you know prophetic storytelling in some way, I know it's difficult to do, but I, I, I think uh, part of the, the whole, uh, that total mission thing is uh, asking what is God doing? Uh, and yes, we can go back to that point that it's, uh, we need to learn to be Christ-like because at the moment we are, we are dealing with another massive upheaval in the, and, and reformation, very much like what was going on in the New Testament. So, you know, we, we have come full circle, but we are still where we are and, and dealing with our own context and an eschatological horizon, very different to that of the, uh, the early church. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts in response, Michael? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I'd love that. I, I think you're right, Andrew. I think, um, it, we do need to have that eschatological horizon uh, to, to look forward to. Uh, um, we need to have that perspective. And I think this is so important for uh, the context of, of uh, it, what we would do anywhere in the world, um, it, missiologically speaking, is to think in terms of what is it that God is doing now? Um, I don't think with the end of the New Testament that God ceased to be involved in culture. Um, mm -hmm or cease to be involved in the lives of people or in communities. Um, I think he's still very much active and, uh, and very present and a part of the beauty that uh, is being Christian is being able to recognize where it is that God is at work and join him in that work. And Andrew, I think one of those places, of course, is with those marginalized communities. Uh, God is at work in those places in unique ways, and he calls his church to be at work uh, alongside of him in, in those spaces, uh, but in other places as well. I mean, God's at work uh, and desirous to see his church be a culture shaper, a transformer, not in the sense of getting involved in the culture wars that we think of today, um, you know, the wars on the vaccine or masks or politics or whatever, uh, but, but certainly uh, transformative in terms of uh, that living out what is, you know, you think of the, the letter that was written to the Roman official uh, describing the extraordinary lives of uh, the first Christians, that that was transformative. Um, and that's, in large part, that's what we lack today. Um, you know, those people that we might be able to point to and say, you know what, that, that is an exemplary life, an extraordinary life that is pointing people to Christ just by simply living it out in a Christ-like manner. And I think we're uh, desperate for people that we might be able to imitate. Um, you know, I'm always 
stunned when I think of what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, when he says, follow me as I follow Christ. What a, a, a challenge uh, for us as believers today to be able to say like Paul, you know, follow me as I follow Christ. And, um, and I mean, as I at least look at the growth of that first, second, third century church, it was largely due to people living Christ-like lives and those observing them uh, that saying, you know, that is an extraordinary life. That, that's what I want to be like. And, uh, and I think that was, you know, a part of the beauty of the growth of, of that early church. Certainly there were evangelistic things that were happening, uh, but more often than not, it was that life uh, that exemplified and imitated Christ that drew others to him. And as a result, the, the transformation that took place in society um, uh, on every level, social, uh, uh, religious, educational, uh, political, and, and so on. I know you gentlemen have a lot more in you, and we've only been able to scratch the surface on a very important conversation. But as we draw this conversation to a close, what would some final thoughts be, and maybe a suggestion of a resource or two, for those who are, are thinking through these kinds of issues, the challenges we face in the church, and how do we, how do we rethink our assumptions and, and move forward in ways where the church can be meaningful and meet the challenges of this current moment? Well, I would point people to Andrew's great work uh, on on uh, women in society uh, and in the church, as well as uh, the work that he did on uh, on uh, uh, homosexuality and sexual identity. I mean, I, I love when the theologians are really engaging in those kinds of cultural issues, and uh, Andrew's a great resource for that. <laughs> <laughs> That's very sweet of you, Michael. Uh, which means, of course, I have to recommend a physiology, which I, 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 I'm, in, I'm enjoying. I, I can use that. I, uh, it, there's, I, I have, to, I have to live with this tension um, between the, the practical demands of church life and mission and preaching and and what have you, and and this this sort of intense uh, attempt to sort of sh uh, shut the shut things out, shut everything else out, and just sort of ask, well, how did things look from the, the New Testament point of view? Um, I, I'm not, I, I don't have resources up my sleeve, uh, apart from that um, Michael's book. Okay, yeah, um, that's fine. I think I probably need to give it a bit more thought to come up with a, a, a neat summary okay. at this point. Well, that's what I get for springing something like you, like that on you at last minute, but uh, uh, I appreciate uh, the conversation, and uh, hopefully this will get folks uh, thinking, and uh, folks can look in the program notes for your bios and you know, listing of your books, or links to those books, and I would encourage viewers and listeners to, to seek out uh, your websites and the resources that you provide, the writing and reflection that you have done, and uh, I want to thank you for being on the program. It was a pleasure, John. Thanks for yeah, well, thank us. you. This has been a really fun, and and it's been great to sort of reconnect with Michael and, and to get to know you and your bookshelves, which look like they're sort of collapsing, aren't they? Well, they are collapsing. The because, see, now, now you destroyed the illusion. That is uh, my <laughs> podcast backdrop. My library is actually behind that, but uh, uh, so this uh, I'm trying okay. to look a little more professional. But uh, your your actual library is not as neat as that. But it's not as neat. That's that's correct. <laughs> But anyway, I want to thank you, gentlemen, for being on. Again, my guests have been uh, Dr. Michael Cooper and Dr. Andrew Perriman. And uh, seek out their websites and their resources. And uh, I want to thank my uh, folks, the audience, for listening and watching. Until the next episode of the Multi-Faith Matters podcast. <laughs>